Yeah, welcome and thanks for coming to see our talk. My name is Flo and this is Justin. And before we jump in, I want to uh, take apart this title a little bit to give you a better idea of um, what you're going to learn in this talk and what to expect. Um, so since you're here, you probably know that sharding is a, is a tool for horizontally scaling multi-tenant architectures. And it has been um, one of the most important tools that Shopify has used over the last couple of years. And in this talk, we're not going to go too much into detail how we do it, um, but give you a quick introduction on um, the details that you need to know for the rest of the talk. So what do we mean by a mature multi shard platform? So um, like I said, implementing application level sharding um, was a really important accomplishment and a big step for Shopify, but um, it's only, it was only a first step. And once you decide to build something like this yourself and put it in production, there's a whole new set of problems that we, you will run into afterwards. That, um, and th those might be problems that m you might not be um, aware of and that weren't on your radar before, because um, depending on the, the speed of growth of your platform, it might actually take a couple of years before you notice them, but um, eventually you will run into them. And um, what we call a mature multi platform here is basically one where um, those problems have already been baked into the platform and have already been solved. Um, so just a um, upfront warning, we're not necessarily saying that you should do the same thing and implement this all yourself in the same way. Um, but I think the ideas that some of those solutions are based on um, are interesting and, and worth learning about. Um, and of those um, follow-up problems that you only run into years after, after putting something like this in production, um, one of the biggest problems for us was um, rebalancing. And um, we developed a data migration algorithm that's kind of our main tool with which we, we solved this rebalancing problem. And there's a couple of other things that, um, um, that, that we can also um, solve with this uh, data migration algorithm. So the biggest one for us was that last year we migrated our entire data set from physical data centers to Google Cloud. And um, things like decommissioning shards and, and all those like maintenance operations that you run into after a while um, are other problems that you will run into. And then finally, um, like it's often the case with, with problems in this field, they're kind of easy if you allow yourself to take down the system and solve them offline, but they become really difficult if you want to solve them with zero downtime. And um, when it comes to data, even more importantly, it's not just zero downtime that's important, but also you want zero data corruption. So um, in, in this talk, you're going to hear a lot about um, data integrity and how, how much of a priority that was for us. Um, OK, so um, in this introduction, I want to talk a little bit about the, what our data looks like so you get an idea of how applicable those ideas might be for your um, setup, and then take a quick look at how we do um, request routing as well. So um, if you don't know Shopify, it's an e-commerce platform. So our customers are basically merchants and small businesses who create online stores, or how we call them, shops. And um, the data is structured in a way that um, many shops can share the same database. But um, something that is important to know is that all of a shop's data is always stored in the same database. So we don't break up shops and spread them across multiple databases. Um, but we only distribute different shops across different databases. And then another important property that distinguishes this from um, maybe other platforms is that the data set is um, the, the data sets of the individual shops are all completely independent. So it's not possible that one shop references data from another shop, which is very different from something like Facebook or Twitter, where the data set is very strongly connected. Um, our data set is like, um, which was a very nice property for us to to take advantage of, um, is that our data set is very easily um, partitioned by shop ID. And um, to make this even easier, we have this rule in our application that is, that is actually enforced, where every single table has to have a shop ID column, um, which then allows us to very efficiently and easily um, decide or see, see w w which shop this data belongs to. And then finally, the last, um, the last thing you need to know here is that um, every unit of work, so every piece of um, code that you run in our platform, is a, if that's a web request or a background job or a maintenance task, anything that does any kind of work on the shop's data set can only do one shop at a time. 
So you can't have one web request that touches data for two shops. If you want to access two shops, you need to make two requests. And you will see uh, later in this talk why that's uh, relevant. Um, then the next property I want to talk about that is um, important for you to know if you want to understand the tools in this talk is how we do shard aware primary key generation. And um, if you think about the default, like MySQL setup of you have only one database and you have a table and you insert new data, um, what usually happens is you have, a, you have a primary key column, like what we call ID here, and if you insert more data, the next primary key is just the previous one, plus one. And that works fine in an uncharted setup. However, if you now have two databases, and um, one thing to note here is that all, all the shard databases have the same schemas, so they all have the same tables. Um, so the same table exists on all shards. If you do the same approach here and you just fill up the table with the default setup of sequential IDs, you run into this interesting problem where um, two databases generate the same IDs. So there's um, primary key collisions is what we call it, and uh, we actually want primary keys for any given table to be unique across all charts, um, which means if you insert new data, no two, new sh uh, no two charts should ever be able to generate the same ID for a new row. And um, this then allows us to move data between shards without having to worry, to worry about the collisions in the primary keys. So to illustrate how, um, there's a bunch of different ways to solve this, but to illustrate the simple approach that we uh, take, um, let's take a look at uh, an example of only two shards again, um, where this is pretty easy to, de to, to illustrate. Um, so if you have only two shards, you could say one shard generates all the odd IDs and the other shard only generate the, generates the even IDs. And if you do it this way, then you know that there's no collisions, and now you could even move data from one to the other without having to think about what if that ID already exists there. So this um, very simple idea can actually be easily generalized to an arbitrary number of shards, as long as you know the number of shards in advance. So this um, table here illustrates how it would look like with four shards, for example. Basically, um, n, let's say n is the, the maximum number of shards that you want to support, and uh, i is the shard ID of each shard, and then um, each shard generates IDs of the form n times j plus i. And if you do it this way, then the nice properties here are, like I said, they, there's no collisions, but um, another nice property is that there's no central ID generation authority or any, any kind of service required, uh, which is an approach that other systems sometimes take. Um, if you actually want to implement something like this, it's very easy in MySQL. It basically supports it out of the box. There's two configuration parameters called auto increment increment and auto increment offset. And um, in this case, auto increment increment is the number of shards that you want to support, and offset is the ID of each shard. So the, one, the first value is the same across all shards, and the second one is just the ID of the shard. And um, if you want to, um, if you see yourself supporting a large number of shards, like um, hundreds or even thousands, then um, you should probably use 64-bit uh, um, primary keys here to not run out of IDs. And um, this is really something that um, is worth thinking about at the very beginning before you put anything like this in production, because as you can imagine, if you start with the naive approach that I first described and then later change your mind, this is a huge mess to, to regenerate all those ideas and to make sure, get rid of the collisions that you already have. So it's better to make sure that you, you, you never even generate any collisions. Okay, so now that you know a little bit about what the data looks like, I'm gonna give you a quick overview of what the, how we do routing. And when I say routing, I, mean, I don't mean um, like the network layer routing, but more the layer seven, uh, layer seven routing, so like HTTP request routing. And the problem is basically that we have multiple shards and um, you need to know which shard the request to send to. And um, the way we implemented this, um, it's not important how exactly it works, but it's basically um, a bunch of Nginx Lua scripts and uh, some logic in, uh, in Rails. And uh, if a request makes it to a load balancer, um, the load balancers all have access to what we call the routing table, where there's a mapping between domain to shop and then from shop to shard. And this, um, there's a, we, we do a lookup in, against this mapping and then annotate the request uh, 
with an additional request header that gets sent to the uh, application servers, so the, the web um, processes here. And then the, the web server knows which database to talk to. Um, there's a bunch of things that are left out here that are um, also interesting but not really relevant for this talk. So, um, for example, for, for, for this talk, we're just going to pretend that a shard is a database, a MySQL database. In reality, there's also things like Redis and Memcache and Elasticsearch and Kafka and so on. Um, but the MySQL part is the most interesting one. Um, similarly, there's not just um, web workers, but like I said before, we also have things like background jobs and so on. Um, the, but the solutions for those are all um, similar enough that you can probably um, connect the dots. Okay, so now that you understand kind of the basics of what the data and the routing looks like and um, the context in which we are operating, uh, Justin will talk a little bit about the, those follow-up problems that I mentioned before um, that you only run into after a while after you deploy this to production. Thanks, Flo. Sharding was definitely critical at Shopify for surviving the really rapid growth. Uh, but of course, that came with some trade-offs of complexity. And there are quite a few problems here. And if any one of you have implemented a sharded system, I'm sure you're aware of some of them. For example, developers used to be able to query on the main database for debugging purposes or otherwise and get back the results instantly and consistently but now they have to go through this system which will map it across all the shards, that sort of thing. We're not gonna talk about all of these problems today. That would be the subject of several talks, at least. Uh, but we are gonna talk about one completely unavoidable problem, which is when a shard grows too big, it needs to spill and the data needs to go somewhere else. And when you're doing this, care needs to be taken if you wanna maximize your resource efficiency and also avoid downtime for the tenants, and most critically, keep your data integrity. When the first few shards were created at Shopify, a relatively straightforward idea but complicated process was used, which was to split the shards in half. And this was done with a 58-step checklist that took several days and involved a whole team of people um, and that wasn't great. So the summary is that we fully replicated the shard to a copy, schedule some downtime, and then during the downtime, mark that new shard, or that new set of hardware, rather, as a new shard, and update the routing table to point half of the shops randomly at this new shard. Then we bring the system back up, and we can later delete the half of the duplicated data. Several problems with this. One of them is that these binary splits produce underutilized shards, and this is quite easy to understand. If you're splitting a shard, then it probably worked, and that means it's under its total capacity. And so a shard that is half the size is far below its capacity. And you can see this in the chart here. In this chart, shard one and shard 10 are outliers because shard one was a test shard and shard 10 was used to isolate some high load tenants. But in the rest of them, you can see how many of them are way below their capacity. And the reason why they're not all exactly the same is because new shops are being added and they're not being split evenly between all of them. And even if shard splits produce perfect balance of tenants, there are many other dimensions that you might want to optimize on, and in this case, this is the data stored, and that's just one of many uh, dimensions. So this process was both an incredibly large amount of work and not enough precision. So we instead wanted something that was a lot more automated, for one, and for two, ideally be able to move a single tenant at a time. And for good balancing and risk mitigation, sometimes we wanted to move very high load tenants or tenants that might uh, in the future have really high load to shards that are more underutilized or in one case we have one shard dedicated to one tenant because they're so big. Um, so being able to move those around dynamically uh, is a great advantage. And then also this gave us a really convenient system to be able to migrate to a new platform which Shopify was doing in 2017 uh, onto Google Cloud and this let us apply some arbitrary heuristics for what to move and when. 
we could move some test shops at first, um, start with some of the lower volume ones, and we weren't quite sure in the reliability of the new platform yet. And we could delay the most risk averse tenants to the end. Here's what we have to work with. These are two example shards here, each with some example data. So on shard zero, we have shop ID 42 and 77. And on shard one, we have shop ID 58. And you can see that shard zero has all of the odd IDs. Shard one has the even IDs. So that's, uh, in MySQL terms, an auto increment, increment of two, as Flo explained earlier. Then if we want to move shard for, or sorry, shop 42, then first we would select the rows where shop ID is equal to 42, and doing this in batches, and insert those into the target, quite simple. And this has this nice property of not producing any primary key collisions. And conveniently, MySQL will also automatically start the next auto increment value from the next correct ID for that shard. So since the last ID that was inserted was seven, even though this did not conform to the existing auto increment values, the next row that would be inserted would be ID eight. So we update the routing table, and then we can delete the old data, and we're done. And this works fine. Uh, we implemented this as a prototype in Ruby, and could move some test shops around, but there is one clear issue, which is that the application can keep writing to the data while you're moving it. And so if the mover has passed the point where the write is happening, so if it, say, uh, got to row seven already and then a row write happens to row one, then this write will never be applied to the new shard. And this is equivalent to data corruption. And of course, this is a data system. Data integrity is the number one priority. The system is pretty worthless if the tenant is up, but every time that they're, through this time that they're up, all their data is just getting corrupted. So Flo is now gonna describe a bit about how we approach that problem. Yeah, so like, like Justin just said, um, avoiding data corruption was our highest priority in this, in this project, and one form of data corruption is what he just described. The, the data is being modified in the source after it has already been copied, but before the move is completed. And um, later in this talk, you will see that we can we can greatly decrease the time span and the, the window in which this can happen and the, the time span in which the shop needs to be unmodifiable. But there's always, in our system at least, there's always going to be a small period where we have to guarantee that the shop is not getting modified. And in this, in the, in this section, I, I want to describe a little bit how we uh, achieve that. So basically, like I said, the problem is we can't allow a shop to get modified. And, um, Let's talk about a few of quick ideas that you might have. Um, first of all, you might say, why can't we just set the database to read only and guarantee this way that the shop doesn't get modified? And this works in like the rare cases where the shop is the only shop in the database, but if there's other shops in there, um, setting the whole database to read only will affect other shops and not just the one that you're moving. So that's not really an option. Um, can, we, can we kill all ongoing work for the shop? Um, we could, but that's not very graceful, and availability was one of our priorities. Um, also, this kind of has the back to question, like how do you know what work is ongoing, like where do you, where do you track that, and, um, and all that. So, um, and then another approach that I think um, that I've heard other people use is you can mark the shop as locked somehow, and then every time new work for that shop um, attempts to get started, you, you check for that lock, and if it's locked, you don't allow it. And this is almost good enough, but um, we still kind of have to worry about this ongoing work because um, in many, um, in, in, our, in our setup, we had um, web requests that we allowed to run for up to a minute or so. We had background jobs that might run for days. Maintenance tasks might run for weeks. So if, we, if the task is running for a couple of days and then somewhere in the middle we decide that the shop needs to move, um, we can't just ignore that. We need kind of somehow have to know that, this, um, that there's something ongoing. And it turns out, if you take a step back, um, this is actually a, a common problem in computer science. It's called the reader's writer's problem. And um, this common problem has a common solution. And the solution is called shared exclusive locking, um, also referred to as um, reader's writer's locking or a multi-reader lock. It's a common synchronization primitive. And the basic idea is you have, you have this data structure. 
which is called the shared exclusive lock. And there's two parts to it, one, a shared lock and an exclusive lock. And the idea is that any number of processes can acquire any number of shared locks concurrently as long as uh, no process is holding an exclusive lock. And the other way around, only one process can acquire an exclusive lock, but only if no process holds a shared lock. So um, how that maps back to our uh, problem here is that we say all the regular work, all the web requests and jobs and so on, they all need to register themselves by acquiring the shared lock. And the shop mover needs to acquire this exclusive lock, which then guarantees that, first of all, no two shop movers can run at the same time for the same shop, which is a good safety net to have. And also, um, no shop mover can start unless all ongoing work has finished. And once the move is in process, um, or yeah, once the move is in process, no new work can start until the move is finished. So I could talk a whole hour about this one subject, but there's a few things, a few points of advice that I wanted to give you. And um, basically, uh, what, does it, what does it mean when I say it needs to register? And basically, you need to enforce in your application that every time any kind of code is trying to access the data of any shop, without first checking this lock, you need to raise an error and make it really hard for developers to kind of circumvent this, make CI tests fail if someone tries to do this. Um, because the safety of this, this approach depends on the assumption that the code is respecting this, um, this lock. Ideally, you would make this invisible and bake it into your framework so that people don't really have to worry about it too much unless they do something super weird. Um, but if they do decide to do something out of the ordinary, uh, you need this safety net. And then finally, um, like I said, this is a pretty common and simple data structure, and the idea is not very complicated, but don't underestimate how long it will take to refactor your legacy code base to respect this idea. Um, in our case, it took several people, several weeks, I think maybe in several months, to um, make sure that this is uh, um, correctly implemented everywhere. Um, so like I just said, this, this um, has the um, side effect kind of that um, as soon as the shop move is starting, no new ongoing work for the shop can begin which is a problem if the shop is big and it takes a long time to move it uh, because the shop is now effectively down for a long time. And Justin is now going to talk about how to minimize that um, length of, the length of that period of time. So we have a shop mover that works and now we are avoiding corruption, so that's good. But we still have a lot of write down time for the shop. And in some cases, shops could be hundreds of gigabytes, and this could mean hours or even days of downtime. This process is below what the raw disk and network capabilities would be, uh, just due to all the overhead involved. So instead of locking the shop at the start, we can try this idea of copying the data in batches as before without taking the lock, and then look at what changes were made to the source data and replicate those as well. MySQL provides a good building block for this. It has a built-in replication system that's used to create a full copy of the data, typically for allowing higher throughput reads or for backup purposes, high availability, et cetera. And this works by writing every update to a log, and this log is called the binary log, or bin log for short. And it can run in two modes, either a statement-based replication in which MySQL writes the statement that updated the data to the log, and then the replica applies it as if it had been issued that statement. Or it can run in row-based replication, where every modified row is written with the old and new values for that row, and then the database will grab those new values and figure out what row it belongs to and update it. In the case of row-based replication, here's an example. If we were to insert this row here, it would create bin log entry number one with a previous value of null, this row didn't exist before, and a new value of ID1, shop ID42, data socks. And conversely, deletes would have a new value of null because the row is being deleted. So if we were to change the value from, say, socks to gloves here, we'll get bin log entry number two inserted. Pretty straightforward. Row-based replication is really convenient for implementing this type of system uh, as it allows us to inspect the values in the row 
and simply apply this as the new state. And because we had that shop ID column in all of our tables, it's trivial to filter out the rows that belong to a particular shop that's being moved. And if you had a more complicated sharding setup, perhaps with a composite key or whatever, uh, you could do arbitrary filtering there. So we can run through an example with two shards here. This is our starting state. And let's say the last entry in the bin log is entry six. And let's copy shop ID 42. These are the rows we'll copy. We'll start by checking the current bin log position, which is six, and streaming the events from that point. And supposing our batch size is one, here for de demonstration purposes, we'll copy the first row, not taking the locks yet. And then suppose that the application goes and writes the value and it sets it to mits. MySQL will write this update to the bin log. There it is at ID seven. The mover process will see this event. It'll apply it to shard one. Then we can say the batch copying finishes, but suppose right at that point, the application writes again to row seven. And if we were to change the shop start idea at this point, we would have the same issue as before, where we actually lose the write. So to ensure consistency, we still need to lock the shop, finish replaying the bin log up until the point the shop was locked, and only then change the shard idea. So in this process, let's say now we lock the shop, we mark the point in the bin log where the shop was locked, and finish replaying up to there, and now we can change the shard ID, unlock the shop, and we're done. So during this locking period, the shop is read-only. Uh, it takes about 2.5 seconds uh, on average. That was a number from our move to cloud, where we moved every single shop. Um, the, it's, you might still try to get rid of this lock. I mean, like, I tried for a long time to think about ways. Um, of course, lots of other smarter people have spent a long time, too. And you always need some kind of a way to prevent the uh, to prevent two transactions from running on the two shards at the same time, otherwise you lose your asset properties of the database. And without going to much more complicated systems, um, you're always going to need something like this. So this is great, works in theory, but given that data integrity is our number one priority, we want to ensure that there are no bugs. Um, we can't do that perfectly, but we can use somewhat of an insurance plan that Flo is going to describe now. Yeah, so one, one aspect of data integrity, integrity that we talked about before is the, the locks to ensure that data isn't modified when it shouldn't be. Um, but we also want this safety net where, um, like Justin said, we, we can't prevent bugs, but we at least want to be able to detect them when um, a bug caused data corruption. And um, so basically we, we want, after, after we copy uh, a shop from one shard to the other, but before we make the final step and update the shard ID, we want to um, look at the data one last time and verify that what we just copied is actually the same as what was in the old chart before. So in, in this section, uh, we will describe a simple approach that has been very efficient for, our, uh, for us um, and that is actually pretty generic and that you, you might even be able to use this in other, uh, for other kinds of problems outside of this context. Um, so here we have two databases with the same table, and we just copied shop two's data from the database on the left to the database on the right. And um, the, sh the, the move is now almost finished, but we haven't updated the shard ID yet. And before we, we mark the move as, as completed, we want to verify that this data is the same. And there's a few um, reasons why we want to do this and a few uh, different types of problems that we have already caught this way. Um, so some examples are like MySQL encoding problems or maybe the, the two databases had slightly different column types configured or um, we caught a bunch of implementation bugs in our mover code this way. Um, so if you um, do the stupidest thing that might work, like the simplest approach, is you just download all the data from, from A and download all the data, data from B and then you compare if it's the same. Um, obviously, if there is a lot of data, then this is pretty heavy on the network. It takes a long time. This, we have some shops that are over 100 gigabytes, um, and then comparing all this, this, all this data client side can be expensive too. So, um, you already kind of I already hinted at the idea um, for the better solution that we do, and that is, um, can we somehow decide whether or not the data is the same without actually downloading all the data? And um, so you might ask, can't we, can't we um, 
can we count the, count the server tells if the data is the same? And um, unfortunately, you can't run a query against the servers that tells you exactly if the data is equal or not, because you're talking about two different servers here, and they're not connected. They don't talk to each other. So you still need the client. But what you can do is you can ask the server to digest the data and send you a digest, a fingerprint. And then you compare the fingerprints instead of comparing the entire data set. Um, so I want to run you through the, the idea quickly that um, how you can generate this fingerprint. Um, so like I said, you, you, we select all the data for shop two here and ignore all the other data. And then we hash all the columns with something like MD5, or you can use SHA-1 or any other um, hash function that your database supports. Then instead of dealing with the raw data, you now have hashes. And now you use a um, MySQL built-in function called group concat, which basically turns um, an arbitrary number of rows into one single row by concatenating all the values. Then we can hash that again to make it smaller again. Now you can use a, the, the MySQL function concat, which does something similar to group concat, concat. Instead, for rows, it does it for columns. So now you concatenate all the columns, you can hash that again, and then you get to a point where you have an entire batch of data that might be gigabytes or in uh, raw data, you have it digested into a single hash value. And now you can run this query against both the old and the new shard. And if the fingerprint is the same, then you know um, that with very high probability, the data is also the same. And if it's not the same, then you should probably abort the move because there might be some data corruption. So if you put all this together, it looks something like this. Um, if you, if you can't read this, uh, we're going to put the slides uh, online later. And then, so with this idea, basically all the heavy lifting happens in the database, not on the client. It's very light on the network. There's only um, about m times n hashing operations. And when we first implemented this, we saw a speed up of about um, a factor of five. And to bring this back to the algorithm that Justin just described, where, you, where we um, look at the MySQL bin log for changes, um, we basically copy a batch of data and then verify, run this verification algorithm. And then as new bin log changes come in, we keep track of them because the, uh, those changes mean that the rows that were affected by the change need to be verified again. And then at the very end of the move, um, before um, switching over the, the, before updating the routing table and switching over the shard ID, we, um, Keep we um, run through this queue again and make sure that everything that changed has been verified a second time. And uh, if you have um, if you have shops or tenants with very high write throughput, where the bin log gets updated very quickly, um, there's an optimization here that you can make where um, before right before you lock the shop, you you just keep keep re-verifying as changes come in until you can't get the queue to get smaller anymore. And um, that that was one of the most important optimizations we made for this act to actually be feasible. As I mentioned before, there were many parts to this system that we weren't going to focus on today. Um, and even within the balancing system, there are some parts that we couldn't go into detail for. But just to give you a taste and some of the solutions, one of the key parts to being able to orchestrate this move to cloud uh, in a sort of sane way was having a nice queuing system where we could upfront calculate a big batch of moves to do and queue those all to be done over the next few days or so on and still be able to execute moves in high priority when, say, someone wanted to move a shop to Canada because it's a cannabis shop and you can only keep the data there, et cetera. So we need some system for that. We also needed some way to actually run these processes. They were a bit snowflakey because they're themselves violating the abstraction of the application where it's not allowed to connect to two shards at once. So we can proudly claim to have moved to cloud within tmux sessions uh, and a lot of scripts around tmux, which was pretty ghetto, but you know we had a deadline and it worked. Um, <laughs> these days it's in Kubernetes. It's a lot nicer. Flo mentioned that some of these background jobs could take a long time. Rather than waiting for them to exit, which would take a long time, we had to fully roll out a way to interrupt them. And then when they are run the next time, it would 
check what shard the shop is supposed to be on, and if it is changed, then it would push it to the right queue. We, of course, also had other data stores. Some of them we just chose to say the data will be lost, but um, anything that's not like cache data, we wanted to have some solution for. And finally, one of the biggest cause of failures in this system that caused a, a move to be aborted and the uh, thing to be retried later was schema changes. And these are done a lot at Shopify, uh, sometimes on the order of tens per day. So we had to come up with some kind of a way to detect these and at least just recopy the table that changed instead of the whole data set. And the nice property is that the biggest tables aren't changed that much. You can get fancier here by trying to intersect the schemas um, and came up with an algorithm for that but decided not to implement it because it would just be way more complicated. So just in closing here, there's many ways to map a tenant to a shard. Pick the right function that works for your use case, and in our case, a routing table was really nice because then we could change which shard a tenant mapped to extremely easily. And also, that table is way smaller than a data set. When you're generating IDs on your shards, coming up with a, a good way to do this is uh, going to save a lot of headache, and there's no optimal way. They all have problems, but um, in our case, the best trade-off was to avoid the global coordination. And if you implement sharding, you're going to need to deal with rebalancing at some point. Uh, you probably want to think about this at the start, make sure that the system is well designed for it. Data integrity is number one, of course. If your system can tolerate downtime, this is easy, but if it can't, uh, this shared exclusive locking strategy works. And the replication log is a great way to make sure that you can do this with minimal downtime. This fingerprinting approach is really useful for checking in all manner of use cases when you're migrating data. Um, you're simply trading off some probability of false positives. And finally, you probably don't need to build this. Um, this was one of my favorite projects to design at Shopify, and it was an interesting topic to discuss. Uh, there are several tools in the wild, though, if you want a more full-featured solution that sort of takes over the whole sharding stack. Uh, Vtest from YouTube is a pretty popular open source option, and it has a very similar rebalancing mechanism that causes write downtime. Um, and CytusDB is another uh, fairly uh, well used, and I've heard really good things about it, uh, another proxy-based solution built on Postgres. And they solve the uh, write block problem by actually queuing writes, um, so there's no downtime, or sort of like no uh, dropped work. Our solution is open source. Uh, we use this for a bunch of other things, like migrating between incompatible pl cloud platforms. Um, this implements everything we discussed, including iterative verification, optimizations for high latency links, um, and it has a TLA plus specification available that describes the algorithm and provides some level of model validation, although, of course, there will inevitably be differences in the implementation. Thanks very much. Thank you.